A Lesson Before Dying, Chapter 16. I was walking around the schoolyard with my ruler when I saw my aunt, Reverend Ambrose, and Miss Emma come back down the quarter after seeing Jefferson. The car stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, and the three of them got out and went into the yard. Reverend Ambrose looked over his shoulder toward the church, but the picket fence kept him from seeing me. After they had gone inside the house, I continued around the schoolyard, slapping my leg with the ruler. It was a quarter to three, nearly time to dismiss the children for the day. I re-entered the church through the front door. Irene Cole and another girl and a boy stood at one of the blackboards. We had discussed our Christmas program, and now they were writing down names of students who would bring the Christmas tree, as well as those who would decorate it. I went to my desk and topped my ruler for attention. It's about time to go home. Any questions before we dismiss? Irene? No, sir, she said from the blackboard. Marshall and Clarence and Alec are getting the tree. Shirley, Odessa, and I will see that it's decorated. Mr. Joseph's got some lint cotton in his crib, and we can get some crepe paper from Miss Eloise. She said she had a lot left over from making the Mardi Gras hats. What about the tree, Clarence? Guess we'll just go back in the pasture and get one like we did last year. He grinned. Do you think you might be able to find a little pine tree this time? We'll try, he said, and laughed to himself. The year before, the boys had brought in a small oak tree. They had dragged it through the mud all the way from the pasture, and by the time it got to the school, it had lost many of its leaves. The girls who were to decorate the tree had to wash it clean before putting on the lint cotton and crepe paper. It turned out to be a beautiful Christmas tree. One other thing before we dismiss the class. I want you all to remember one person during this Christmas season. I'm sure I don't have to remind you who I'm thinking about. If there are no other questions, you may collect your things and leave. I, and I don't want to hear any noise out there in the quarter. Class dismissed. After they had gone, I sat down at the table, looking over the tests I had given the sixth graders in geography. The assignment was to draw a map of Louisiana and write in the names of the parishes and their appropriate places. After about five minutes, I heard footsteps entering the church. Then I saw that one of the boys had stopped halfway down the aisle. I knew what he was going to tell me. Miss Emma say, on your way home, stop by. I nodded my head and he left, walking slowly until he got to the door. Then he burst out running. I gathered up all my papers and after closing and locking the back door, I went out through the front. Miss Emma's house was only a short distance down the quarter. They were sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee when I came in. Some coffee? Miss Emma asked me. No, ma'am. Thomas said you wanted to see me. Sit down, Grant, she said. I could tell by the way she said it and by the silence of my aunt and Reverend Ambrose that things had not gone well at the jail. I pulled out a chair and sat down facing Miss Emma. My aunt and Reverend Ambrose sat opposite each other. You didn't tell me the truth the other day, did you, Miss Emma said. I don't know what you're talking about, Miss Emma. When you come back from seeing him. Sure, I told you the truth, I said. No. She shook her head, pressing her lips tight as she looked across the table at me. He didn't like the food. He didn't ask about me. He did last Friday. No, she said, and shook her head again, because I had to hit him today. She stared at me, her lips pressed tight, and she lowered her head. Reverend Ambrose reached out and touched one of her arms as he said, Sister Emma, Sister Emma. My aunt put her hand on the other arm and looked at me. A couple of days later, Miss Eloise came up to the house, and from my room, I could hear my aunt telling her what had happened. Jefferson was asleep, or pretended to be asleep, when they got to the cell. The deputy rattled the big keys against the bars and called Jefferson's name before opening the door. After they had gone inside, the deputy locked the door and told them that he would be back within the hour. They could call if they wanted to leave earlier. 
Jefferson lay on the bunk with his back to him, them, and there was no place for them to sit. Miss Emma managed to get a small place to sit by pushing him gently closer to the wall. She passed her hand, her hand over his head and his shoulder while she whispered his name. Ain't you gonna speak to me, she said. Ain't you gonna speak to your company? Finally, he turned, looking in their direction. He wasn't seeing them, my aunt told Miss Eloise. He asked as though, he acted as though they were not even in the room. His eyes were a total blank, my aunt said. Just blank, blank, was how she said it. I brought you some food, Miss Emma told him. I brought you a shirt, too, a pretty shirt. You want to see it? She took a polo shirt from the paper bag and spread it out with both hands. But he showed no sign of seeing the shirt, or even of hearing Miss Emma. Reverend Ambrose went up to the bunk and said to him, Young man, I pray for you every night, and I know the Lord is hearing my prayers. Put all your faith in him, and he'll bring you through. That touched something in him. He looked up at the reverend, and for a moment it seemed he would say something. Something cruel, mean, my aunt said. She said that, standing back, looking at him. She could see his hate for Reverend Ambrose. Miss Emma put the shirt back into the bag and opened the basket with the food. Come on, eat something for me, she said. I brought all the best things you like. You brought corn, he, the vo his voice said. Not him, my aunt said. Just the voice. He didn't show a thing in his face. His eyes were blank blank, my aunt said. Corn? Miss Emma asked. He didn't answer her. Roast years? He looked at her, but he didn't answer. And his eyes were just blank. Blank, blank, my aunt said. He could have been looking at the wall or the floor for all the recognition he showed her. This ain't roast years season, Jefferson. That's in the sp Miss Emma told him. That's in the spring, this November. Roast New Year's all over now. He didn't look at her with hate, as he had the reverend. But there was no pity either, my aunt said. He didn't show any feeling at all. Corn for a hog, he said. Corn for a hog? A hog, Jefferson? You ain't no hog, Jefferson. You ain't no hog. Throw something, he said. I'll never throw you nothing, Jefferson, Miss Emma said. You throw a bone to a dog, slop to a hog. You ain't no hog. That's all I'm is, he said. He turned away from her. I didn't ask to be born. Jefferson, Miss Emma said. Jefferson. He wouldn't answer her, and she used all her great bulk to pull him over. You ain't no hog, you hear me? You ain't no hog. That's all I'm is, he said, fattening up to... She slapped him. Then she fell upon him and cried. My aunt told Miss Eloise. My aunt and Reverend Ambrose went to the bunk and tried to pull her away, but she was still slumped over him when the deputy came back to let them go. At her kitchen table now, as I sat there, Miss Emma looked at my aunt. What I done done, Lou? She asked. What I done done? What I done done to my master to deserve this? My aunt saw that she was going to cry, and she stood up and put her arm around her shoulders. Emma, she said, Emma, the Lord is merciful. What I done done? She was shaking her head and crying now. What I done done, my master? Have patience, my aunt said, patting her on the shoulder. The Lord is merciful. What I done done, she cried, to make my master hate me so. The Lord don't hate you, Sister Emma, Reverend Ambrose said, touching her on the arm. The Lord is with you at this moment. He's only testing you. Miss Emma looked up at me. The tears were still rolling down her face. Go back, she said. Why, Miss Emma? Because somebody gonna do something for me before I die. Why me? Because you the teacher, my aunt said. I got up from the table. And where you think you going, Tant Lou asked me. I don't know, I said, but I'll go crazy if I stay here, that's for sure. You going back up there, Grant? 
What for? I said. What for, Taunt Lou? He treated me the same way he treated her. He wants me to feel guilty, just as he wants her to feel guilty. Well, I'm not feeling guilty, Taunt Lou. I didn't put him there. I do everything I know how to do to keep people like him from going there. He's not going to make me feel guilty. You going back, she said. You ain't going to run away from this, Grant. Taunt Lou, I said. I wanted to take her face in my hands. I wanted to hold her gently. Gently because anger and screaming were not working. Maybe gentleness would work better. Maybe feeling my hands on her face would make her understand what I was trying to say to her. But as I moved toward her, I could see in her eyes that nothing I said was going to change anything. I left them at the table and went back home to my room.